Okay. We are now live online and in person. So let's get started. Okay. Well, uh, thank you everybody for coming, uh, whether you're in person or um, tuning in online. My name is Pat Kane, Public Programs Manager with the Champaign County Forest Preserve District's Museum and Education Department. Um, and we are here today, uh, this afternoon, as we continue uh, our special exhibit speaker series, also kick off our 15th annual Lincoln Lecture Series uh, with a program titled Medicine from the Past, a sampling of medicine from the Civil War era in Springfield area, where in a few short moments, I'll turn the program over to our guest, Michael Mosley, today. Uh, before we do get into today's program, I just want to go over a few other items before we get started. Uh, for the first time ever, as I mentioned from the start, we're trying hybrid style format for today's program. We have patrons joining us in person as well as online um, for this afternoon's event. Uh, we're excited to offer a new program format to our audience, uh, but we ask that you stay patient and flexible with us as we navigate this new challenge. Um, today we're joined by Janie. Um, uh, Janie will be assisting us with American Sign Language Interpretation, and we really appreciate Janie being here today. Um, uh, Museum of the Grand Prairie, if you don't know anything about us, we originally opened in 1968 as the Early American Museum. Our current mission is to collect, preserve, and interpret the cultural and natural history of Champaign County and East Central Illinois. We're a part of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District, a collection of seven forest preserves, educational facilities, golf course, Kickapoo Rail Trail, and so much more. Um, and in fulfillment of our district's mission to protect Champaign County's natural and cultural resources and inspire people to care for, enjoy, and explore their natural world, the Champaign County Forest Preserve District recognizes its responsibility to acknowledge those native peoples who came before us on this land. We currently work to preserve and tell the story of the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Wea, Miami, Kickapoo and Potawatomi Nations. Native Americans shape the landscape that the Forest Preserve District sits within, and we must recognize that the Forest Preserves occupy the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the peoples previously mentioned. They were the first stewards of the land, and it's necessary for us to acknowledge these nations, to work with them, to continue to steward the land, and educate the public with honor and respect. CCFPD will work to be inclusive of all differences and keep Native peoples and their history at the core of our efforts. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this program is one of many programs and a special uh, speaker series of programs we've been hosting since May of 2022. All programs are tied to themes and elements present in our newest special exhibit, A History of Healing, Infectious Diseases, and Community Responses to Defeat Them. Opening last May, the exhibit focuses on the local and worldwide impact of such diseases as the 1918 flu, smallpox, malaria, tuberculosis, polio, typhoid, cholera, HIV, AIDS, and COVID-19. In addition to examining the impact disease has had on our health and well-being, the exhibit, the exhibit highlights particular instances in the past, as well as the present, where local citizens came together during previous epidemics and pandemics for the betterment of their communities. Um, the museum is currently closed in January and February, uh, but we encourage you all to visit us when we reopen on March 1st to check out this exhibit as well as all other exhibits at the museum. Um, uh, today's program is also part of our 15th annual Lincoln Lecture Series, uh, an ongoing effort to discuss many issues and themes associated with the life and times of Abraham Lincoln. And we also encourage you to check out our exhibit when we reopen um, in the basement of our museum, Champaign County's Lincoln. Also, just want to promote a few other programs coming up. Um, on Sunday, January 29th at 2 o'clock, so one week from this afternoon, an online-only program will take place live on our Facebook and YouTube pages. Uh, Dr. Glenna schroeder uh, Lynn, Lyme, uh, author, historian, and former manuscripts librarian for the non-Lincoln manuscripts at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library in Springfield, will present a program on her book titled Lincoln and Medicine. So again, that program one week from today, January 29th, online on our Facebook and YouTube pages. On Saturday, February 25th, at Homer Lake Interpretive Center across the Champaign County Forest Preserve District, uh, we encourage you to register for our annual Maple Sugar Days program. 
Uh, we will explore the science and history behind maple sugaring, uh, visit Homer Lake Forest Preserve's historic sugar maple grove, and learn how to make maple syrup ourselves. Again, the program does require registration, and you can do so at ccfpd.org. Uh, uh, for updates and more info on all programs within this series, as well as what's happening throughout the museum and Champaign County Forest Preserve District, we encourage you to find us on social media or visit our website, museumofthegrandprairie.org or ccfpd.org. Uh, should you have any questions or comments to, um, uh, this afternoon and you're tuning in online, uh, feel free to write those in the comments section. We also encourage you uh, to, if you're tuning in online, let us know where you're watching from this afternoon. Uh, and those in person uh, will address questions at the end, so feel free to raise your hand um, and we'll address those questions at the end of the program. One last thing, Speaker Series is sponsored in part by our friends at Illinois Humanities, and I would like to thank Illinois Humanities for supporting our Speaker Series. We really enjoy working with such great organizations like Illinois Humanities and are very happy to work together to provide these opportunities for our audience. So uh, that long-winded uh, long introduction is now over, um, uh, but I'm going to introduce uh, uh, Michael Mosley, our guest presenter now, who will get to the rest of today's program. So I'd like to thank Mike. Uh, for traveling from Springfield today to be here to present program, uh, today's program and for being flexible to presenting this program in hybrid format. Um, uh, Mike received his, his master's degree in public history from the University of Illinois Springfield and has worked at the Old State Capitol, the Edwards Home at the Springfield Art Association, and as an interpreter for the first History Comes Alive program. He is currently the curator of the Pierce Museum at Southern Illinois University School of Medicine where he is responsible for exhibits and cataloging the collection of approximately 20,000 medical objects. So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Michael Mosley. And then you can go to the next slide just by clicking on the mouse there. So. Hello everybody, thanks for having me today. Um, thank you for Pat, to Pat for uh, inviting me here. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the corner of the Miller Drugstore and the formulary, which is on display here at the Museum of the Grand Prairie, and um, a little some of the issues surrounding it, and people, and everything else. So I want to talk a little bit first. Um, you know, how did we get this thing? Uh, it was donated back in 2005. Um, unfortunately, our longtime curator um, of decades died about a year later. And as things go with small museums, budget kind of took precedence and her position was not replaced until I came along in 2019. So all of the uh, institutional knowledge about where things were and, you know, who knew what was gone. So when I started, um, my first duty was to go through all of her things, which were locked away in her old office. And I was going through lots and lots of papers and uh, various items that I had no idea where they came from, but I finally came across a set of old balance scales that's them up there and they're made out of brass and they're on that wooden case or at that drawer and I pulled it open and there was this little diary looking book in there. And so I opened it up and there were all these recipes for medicines in there. And then I looked at the back of the front cover and it was signed by Roland Weaver Diller and Charles S. Cornell. And I knew exactly what it was then. It was the recipe book for the Lincoln Family Pharmacy. And uh, it had intersected with some of the lives of some of the most important people in Illinois history and national history. Um, and it's arguably now, arguably, our most important object. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm happy to have lent it to the Museum of the Grand Prairie and have it on this place mm -hmm. somewhere because people can see it. And it also came, um, it was from William Hughes Diller who donated it. He's the great grandson of William Weaver Diller. And like I said, we got the battle scale and then that little case on the right hand side of the picture there. And then that's our pharmacy. All right, so I want to put the formula, formulary in its like proper context because it's, you know, we're talking about 19th century medicine and it is wholly different from anything we are experiencing, that we have experience with right now. 
Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Springfield in the first half of the 19th century because disease and health was intimately tied with geography. And then I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of the theory of medicine uh, as it was constructed in the 19th century. So first of all, uh, this is Springfield as it appeared in 1820 on the left, and it's you can't even see the little box, but that's modern Springfield on the right, and the end of the arrow is where it was right there. So it's just teeny tiny compared to what it is now. Um, in 1839, uh, Springfield became the capital, so it was only 19 years after uh, the first settlement into the area. So really wasn't that different. Um, but as more people came to the area, they tried to spur more settlement. So these kind of stories came out about how Sangamon County was sort of this paradise, kind of land of Goshen sort of thing. And that's kind of how it was remembered, um, particularly by Zimri Enos, who was the son of one of the original settlers, Pascal Pete Enos. Um, he was quoted in the transactions of the Illinois State Historical Society. Uh, in 1909, like this, and this is a sort of a long quote, so bear with me. Uh, he said Calhoun, which is what Springfield was called then, was situated in the middle of a handsome undulating prairie nook, a mile in length east and west, and half a mile north and south, thoroughly drained by never failing spring branches, and bordered on the north by heavy timber, and on the south by a number of beautiful groves of young forest trees, pin oak, elm, cherry, and hackberry, which were festooned with grapevines and fringed with plum and palm bushes, crab apples, hazelnuts, alders, and blackberries, and encircled by millions of strawberry vines, which sounds really nice. <laughs> um, the second quote I have here is from Pastor John Bergen, and he was also a recent immigrant to the area, and he was actually writing this to another perspective immigrant. And he said, two of our phys physicians, one having received his education in Philadelphia, the other in New York, and both having been in this country about 10 years, agree in seeing that these parts are as healthy as any in the West. Mm -hmm. Even in the first settling of it, the immigrants here did not suffer so much with sickness as they did who fell the first timbers of Kentucky, Ohio, and New York. So both of these were really optimistic accounts about what was going on. I'm sure they weren't really in line. Maybe that was their experience. Um, I'm sure Zenry remembered it that way, but this area was known for disease, particularly malaria, which it had, was so common that it acquired its own nickname, which was the Illinois Shakes. Um, and it wasn't helped by the living conditions. Pioneer cabins, like that one down at the bottom, were dark, humid, warm, with these gaping windows and doors and were uninsulated, and, they, and that just meant mosquitoes could get in and out as they pleased. And, but, once they got in, it would come out. Uh, there is a story of a physician going to see a family who was struck with malaria, and he opened the door, and it was just like a cloud of mosquitoes inside. Mm -hmm. um, and the landscape around Springfield was low lying, kind of swampy. Um, it was, Springfield was in the middle of this sort of little valley, uh, and you know, mosquitoes love that sort of thing. Um, so the town branch was a creek that ran through, um, and then it was fed by all these smaller creeks, and during rains it would turn into this deluge and erode the shores and leave these puddles of water. And as the town grew, it kind of turned into this open sewer sort of situation, but it was still popular for swimming and fishing. Um, city roads turned into dirt, or were dirt, and they turned into muddy quagmires after rains. Uh, you can see that's Fifth Street in 1859. That's kind of after the time period you were talking about there, but there are streets still there. Uh, people would just wagon wheels form these deep ruts, uh, and water would just stand there and be breeding down for mosquitoes. And actually, there's so many other stories of horses getting stuck up to their bridles in the mud. I don't know if those are true or not, but <laughs> it gives you an example. Um, and then people just kind of threw their trash into the street, and you can see some of it there. Um, also, livestock kind of roamed around town, pigs particularly. They were rooting up the sidewalk plants looking for food, and it was actually the source of some debate whether they should let the pigs do it or not, because 
those in favor of the pig said at least then they might be the trash. Um, so that covers that. I want to talk a little bit about the theory of medicine now. Um, so there are two. Um, I'll cover miasma theory first. So medicine and the theory behind it didn't hasn't advanced much beyond what it had been in Renaissance and even earlier in a lot of cases. Um, for example, miasma theory dated back to Hippocrates, so we're talking 2,000 years to the time we're talking about right now. Uh, germ theory was completely unknown. Louis Pasteur didn't develop that until the 1850s, and it was still even later until it was widely adopted, and later even still in the United States. We like the right um, but in short, miasma theory states that uh, my, miasmas or bad air um, cause disease. So you would inhale the miasma and it would cause you to get sick. And these were associated with sort of like swampy, swampy low-lying areas like Spurfield. And it was believed that they were caused by a rotting and putrefying organic matter. Um, so anywhere you would find that stuff, like the trash on the street, the animal droppings from the pigs, the ruts in the road, all of that stuff. Um, but we still put some effort into dispelling them because, and as an example of this, during the second cholera pandemic in 1832, the Springfield Board of Health required citizens to remove all nuisances on their premises purified by a free use of lime while cellars, samples, gutters, etc. Um, as it happens, lime, which is also called calcium carbonate, uh, does have antimicrobial properties. So it may have actually helped. Um, Jacksonville, for example, which is just west of Springfield, didn't try these things and they were completely decimated. Um, another thing they would use kind of curiously is during this pandemic particularly is they would fire off cannons around cities. And I guess the thing okay. is the sound would do something and dispel <laughs> my asthma. Um, another example is during the Civil War, surgeons would clean their operating tables with carbolic acid. Um, it also has antimicrobial properties. And in fact, it is the chemical that Joseph Lister used when he pioneered aseptic technique. Um, but it also, they didn't know that it was just to dispel my asthma. Um, Efforts to control miasmas also extended to home design. Uh, people who could afford it would uh, buy a house or build a house that was open air and had these big windows that would in plenty of light. And we can still see some of these things today in design because there are tran if anybody has like transoms over their doors, that was to keep the air flowing and keep out miasmas. The whole idea was to keep the air circulating and don't let it stay. So the second sort of theory that was underpinning medicine at the time was humoral theory. And this dates back to the Roman physician Galen. He was actually the uh, physician to the gladiators. And this stated that humans are made up of four humors or substances, and these are blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. And every person has a certain proportion of these in their body. And when one gets out of proportion, that's when disease happens. Um, so the humors could also be either hot or cold or wet or dry. Um, so for example, black bile was dry and cold. So if you had too much of that, you would need to be treated with something that was hot and wet. For example, capsicum, which is the spicy stuff in peppers. Uh, so you would get that as medicine. Um, too much blood, for example, that just meant bloodletting usually. Um, and that was easy. And that was often fallen back on because blood was the most accessible of all the humors. Um, by the time we're talking about humoral theory had kind of fallen out of favor, but a lot of the treatments centered on bloodletting and purging and emetics and all of those things. So it was pretty clearly like underpinning what was going on. Um, so all this sounds really weird. Oops. There it goes. All right. Uh, all this sounds really crazy, I fully admit, but I do want to try and rehabilitate the 19th century position a little bit. Um, 
at least the well-educated ones. Uh, a lot of it was based on like a master apprenticeship sort of relationship. So if they were learning from a good doctor, then they were good. And also uh, at this time, there were medical schools in the East. Philadelphia really was the center of medical education in the US. Um, so anyway, the good ones were very well versed in anatomy. Um, surgeons could be extremely skilled. Uh, they could perform operations in minutes or seconds, even if they were really good. Uh, at this time, they had a smallpox vaccine, Edward Jenner had developed that in 1796. And they also had medicines that actually worked. Uh, they had quinine, for example, which is still effective for malaria. Um, another example would be willow bark, which was effective for mild pain relief. It actually contains a compound that's almost identical to modern day aspirin. And then, of course, they had opium and morphine uh, for more major. Uh, symptom relief. And these are just some of our items here that we have at the, the museum. Uh, you have the uh, amputation kit in the corner on the left, uh, the crepination kit on the upper right, um, some cocaine hydrochloride on the bottom right, and then the pad medicine there. Just going to show those off. <laughs> so, with all of this effective medicine, it left an opportunity open for somebody who wanted to make it in the pharmacy occupation. And that brings us to William Smith Wallace and the Golden Mortar. So William Wallace was born on, in 1802 in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And like a lot of doctors, he was educated in the East. Um, he graduated from Jefferson Medical School in 1824, and that's in Philadelphia. Um, and he practiced there until he came to Springfield in 1836. Uh, he actually didn't like practicing medicine at all. Uh, he came out here, uh, he wanted to try his hand at land speculation in Missouri. Uh, but when he got to Springfield, he either, he, he decided to stay in practice medicine. We don't know the reason. It could be that sort of the realities of land speculation didn't really meet with his expectations. Or the story that's usually told is his friends lived in Springfield and they knew he was a doctor, so they convinced him to treat their medical problems and um, he just decided to settle there because he re realized that was more realistic. So whatever the case is, on July 27th, 1838, he announced he would offer his services as a physician from his shop, which he called the Golden Mortar. And it was very common for doctors to operate doctor shops, which is where they would sell. There are small, small stores that they would sell medicines from, and that kind of seems like what that's what this is. Uh, and it was located on the ground floor of a larger building. Um, and upstairs was the law offices of John Todd Stewart and Abraham Lincoln. Um, and then upstairs and over was the op law or the office of Dr. Anson G. Henry. And uh, on the right there, that's a painting looking north from the top of the old state capitol in Springfield. And you can see it on the very, very left side is a row of buildings, and that's Hoffman's row where his office was. So I want to talk a little bit about Anson G. Henry, first of all. Uh, he is an important figure in central Illinois medicine and politics too, but that's not my area. Um, so he was recognized as one of the best doctors in Springfield, and he was an expert on the Asiatic cholera, which is the epidemic of cholera we all stand out when we think of cholera. So like I mentioned earlier, in 1832, the second cholera pandemic struck, and it was absolutely terrifying. Um, it is a terrifying disease even still. And the hardest hit area around central Illinois was Jacksonville. And he bravely went to Jacksonville to care for patients and do what he could. Um, he was notable in that he disagreed with the mainline treatment idea, which was uh, calomel, mercury chloride. Mm -hmm. um, and instead, he advocated camphor, laudanum, and bloodletting. And for the record, those are both really bad ideas. You shouldn't do either one of those things. <laughs> uh, but what really set him apart was his belief in the cause of cholera. He didn't believe in miasmas. He thought it was called caused because of moral reasons. <laughs> <laughs> and he particularly liked those who 
disliked those who fled from the disease, calling them destitute of moral courage. Um, which, interestingly enough, fleeing the disease is probably the only thing you could have done. Could have done. And he wrote all this stuff down in the same journal, in an open letter. Uh, and obviously, uh, Jacksonville residents were not pleased with this. And so a flurry of letters came back and forth, and no, nobody really gave way. And the only thing that really worked is just letting the pandemic run its course and leave the area. Um, but after the pandemic, he went back to treating patients. Um, so he spent a lot of time at Wallace and Diller, and he was Abraham Lincoln's personal physician for a little while. Um, so back at the store, Wallace dispensed not only drugs, but paints, oils, dyes, cigars, and other forms of tobacco and fancy articles. Um, he's not clear on what fancy articles is. And in 1839, he married Frances Todd, who was Mary Todd Lincoln's sister. Uh, so he developed a very close personal relationship with Lincoln. He saw him almost every day on the way to work. And Lincoln often stopped by to tell him his jokes and stories. Um, and in fact, they were so close that Willie Lincoln is named after him. He was mm -hmm. Willie Lincoln. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't have much of a mind for business. Early uh, mercantile records dismiss him as, quote, with not much capacity, can hardly make a living. And historian Gene Baker wrote that his family, quote, inhabited the precarious borderland between genteel impoverishment and true poverty, unquote. Um, it wasn't all his fault, though. Uh, his patients were often poorer than he was. Um, so he wouldn't get paid in money a lot of times. He'd come away with, like, a chicken or some eggs or something like that. And it makes me wonder if that's the reason he didn't like medical practice. Mm. So he was compelled then to bring on a partner because of the financial reasons and also because he was had to make house calls day and night. And that meant leaving the shop and closing up and losing out on any profits that could have been had. So he found Jonathan Roland Diller. Uh, he was also born in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and he arrived in Springfield in 1837 probably at the request of Wallace, their family, and he was only 23 years old. Um, their families probably knew each other. Um, and they formed a partnership. Wallace would do the doctoring, and Diller would run the pharmacy. And Diller also became good friends with Lincoln at first. Uh, unfortunately, he was a Democrat, and Lincoln was a Republican. Uh, and in fact, they were so close, Lincoln wrote the local congressman, and was able to get Diller appointed as the postmaster of Springfield in 1844. The store was announced in the same journal on September 23rd, 1837, and they listed their new stock. They had lots of patent medicines and all sorts of chemicals that you could use to make medicines. So the patent medicines came pre-made, but anything else would have need to be compounded at the pharmacy, and that's where the formula came in. That's a Scan of a couple pages there. Um, it contains recipes for hundreds of drugs, uh, and anytime a new one was made, it'd be written down for future reference. It doesn't appear to be in any particular order. Uh, sometimes there's recipes that are just a few pages from each from each other, the same one, a few pages from each other, so they couldn't find anything either apparently. Um, but it does tell us the sort of things people were taking, and importantly, what was in them, which we don't know usually. Um, but some of the early notable drugs, like the first one in there is Spirits of Sweet Nighter. So this is a diuretic and antispasmodic, and it is one part alcohol, three parts water, and one part nitrous ether. And it's a pretty simple compound, um, and it's an old remedy that was used throughout the 19th century and even into the 20th. It was actually banned by the FDA in 1980 because uh, it can cause some pretty bad problems. Uh, another one is the Agu pills. Now these are made of quinine sulfate, blue mass, and black pepper, and you're supposed to take one a day until your fever left. Uh, it might have actually worked. So Agu is a is malaria or a malaria-like illness. Often they couldn't tell the difference. Um, so. The, the quinine would work. And then I, I want to mention the blue, blue mass. Um, that is mercury. 
Um, it's a mercury compound, actually. It contains elemental mercury, which is the silver liquidy kind mm -hmm. that we always think of, and it's mixed with lots of herbal um, ingredients. Mm -hmm. uh, and it results in like a pale blue powder and you can form these into pills. And we know that these were taken by Abraham Lincoln as well for hypochondriasis and melancholy. Uh, another one is called Sappington's Pills. These also contain quinine, an extract of licorice, pulverized gum of myrrh, and oil of sassafras. And then there's the Louise Carminative, which contains tincture of opium, asafoetida, oil of anise, calcium, magnesia, and water. So those last two are patent medicines. They apparently had the recipes for these and could make them and sell them under the original label. And when we say patent medicines, we don't mean that the medicine was patented like we think of it. Uh, in this case, patent was like a king's patent, which is basically just a seal of approval. Um, the clever patent medicine proprietor would go out of the way to not patent the medicines, because if you patented the medicines, then you'd have to disclose the ingredients. And if you did that, customers might see that they didn't do anything. Um, but they convinced customers that they worked by uh, usually giving the medicine very visible dramatic effect, and a lot of times this just meant they were laxatives. So back at the drugstore, <clears throat> in 1842, the store moved to its permanent location right across the street on the east side of the street to the old state capital. Uh, the American Druggist and Pharmaceutical Record says, quote, they bought a frame building and become, had been in temporary use as a state house and moved it to 6th Street opposite the Ramada. And then in 1842 is the same year that Thomas Ford became governor and also their most important customer. So I want to talk about him a little bit. Uh, he was born in 1800 in Uniontown, Pennsylvania, and his family was extremely poor. Uh, he was raised by a single mother and his half brother, who was six years older than him. Um, the family moved west. They hoped to establish a farm in Missouri um, because land was being sold for cheap then. But by the time they got here, the Louisiana Purchase had happened and the rules for buying land had changed and that land was no longer available. So they decided to settle in Monroe County. Um, but he was a high achiever. Thomas attended law school with the encouragement of his half brother, whose name was George Forkworth. Uh, and George was also a high achiever. He served in both houses of the Illinois State Legislature and as Secretary of State and as Attorney General. Um, Thomas briefly dropped out to help with his other brother's failing business, but he finished by finished law school or his law degree by reading law with Daniel Pope Cook. Um, and he became a very capable lawyer and judge. So during that time, though, unfortunately, George contracted consumption, and he left for Cincinnati to seek treatment. Um, and Thomas actually resigned his judgeship to go with him and care for him until he died later that year. Mm -hmm. And after that, Thomas returned, and he picked his career back up, and he was elevated to the Supreme Court in 1841. And while he was in Cincinnati with his brother, it's probably where he also contracted consumption. Mm -hmm. um, so consumption is something we don't think about so much. We call it tuberculosis nowadays, though. Uh, it is still around, um, although pretty rare. And it may have killed more people than any other disease in history. Um, and this is backed up, backed up by the Springfield Oak Ridge Cemetery internment records. And it is by far uh, the number one cause of death until the 20th century. Um, some other names it went by were, were the White Plague, the Robber of Youth, Captain of All These Men of Death, or the Graveyard Cough. So that really tells you what people thought of it back then. Um, and it was also kind of associated a little bit earlier than this with things like uh, creativity and beauty, um, especially during the Romantic era. Um, the idea was that it was a little bit like 1990s heroin chic almost. It became fashionable to have a disease. Women, for example, would wear dresses that would cause them to look hunched over at the sunken, sunken in chest, and red makeup would be applied to the cheeks to look like you had a fever. And part of this played into, part of what played into it was the idea of the good death, like 
it was a beautiful way to die because it was slow and you could have your family mm -hmm. and you could impart your knowledge to future generations and things like that. But in reality, it was just awful. It was a terrible thing to have. Um, we don't, unfortunately, know what Thomas thought about it. Uh, he never wrote a lot of that we know of, but we do know what his treatment was like because in the formulary there is a prescription for Governor Ford himself. And you can see there at the bottom it says Governor Ford written underneath. Um, and it contained Ipecac, which we usually think is an emetic that will make you throw up. But uh, in small doses, like in this medicine, it's used as an expectorant. So something that can expel mucus from the lungs in a lot of times. With consumption, treatment focused on clearing out your lungs. Uh, it contained blue mass, which we know is for melancholia and hypochondriasis, but it can also be used for tuberculosis, among other things. Uh, it had quinine in it, which we know is used for any sort of fever, even though it would really only work in malaria. It contained digitalis, which often was used for heart problems. And in this case, uh, it was used to, quote, depress the excited movements of the heart caused by consumption. And then it also contains something called extract of pimenta, which we call allspice. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a weird inclusion, but it was sometimes used to calm the stomach. And a lot of those other things can be really rough on the stomach. So that's probably why it was here. And Governor Ford had also been accused of taking stimulants, and it's very possible that this is what they were talking about. Um, people probably didn't know, aside from Wallace and Miller, that he had consumption while he was in all this. Uh, obviously, the treatment didn't work. He served one term, and he left office completely broke, which was taken as a sign of his honesty, actually. Uh, and he died in 1850 near Peoria, uh, after having written the first history of the life. So, things seem to be going well. Um, they got more business, but unfortunately, politics started to get involved. Um, Jonathan Miller got more and more involved in the Democratic Party, and this displeased Lincoln very much. Uh, he actually wrote to the, Lincoln wrote to the Postmaster General, and I have a quote here. He said, quote, J.R. Miller, the present incumbent, I cannot say has failed in the proper discharge of any of the duties of office. He, however, has been an active partisan in opposition to us. Located at the seat of government of the state, he has been, for part, if not the whole time, he has held the office, a member of the Democratic State Central Committee, unquote. So as a result, Miller was fired from his job. Um, five days after the letter, the partnership of Wallace and Miller was dissolved. It was probably because of the politics. Wallace was, by this time, was Lincoln's brother-in-law, and he probably felt that he couldn't be in business with him anymore. And honestly, Wallace may have had one foot out the door anyway. He was busy with patients most of the time um, and was already busy with his medical practice. So whatever the case, though, Diller purchased Wallace shares on uh, April 12th, 1849. And uh, he did a few renovations, and he bought some new stock. And then after a painful illness of six weeks, he died on June 27, 1849. Um, fortunately, though, the store continued. There was a young clerk and druggist named Charles S. Cornell. And uh, that's his house on the left there. He lived right across the street from Abraham Lincoln. You can go in there if you want to hear his little setup. Yeah. Uh, paper advertisements during this time. Uh, list him as an agent for the heirs of J.R. Diller. Um, and he was in, in very interested in preserving the reputation of the business because he intended to buy it. Um, so one of the first things he did was defend against an attack on the store by a rival store called Virtual and Owen. Um, so Corno had placed ads in the paper for Wallace and Diller's cholera medicine, and he said it had been endorsed by uh, Springfield Board of Health. And that's what Virtual and Owen questioned. And Corno's defense was it had equal parts of the tincture of opium, camphor, and capsicum, and that's exactly what the Board of Health recommended. And really, the recipe was just Wallace and Builder's diary mixture, just rebranded. Um, and it contained a few other items too. Uh, Corno just kind of took the opportunity to make some money from the situation. Um, 
But he was sort of correct in that it had these things. Uh, Wallace was also on the Board of Health, but nobody really brought that up. So, like Wallace before him, Corno had to look for a partner, and he found one in the cousin of Jonathan Roland Weaver Dillard. Uh, he was also young and experienced, but he was willing to learn. Uh, the new store was announced in the paper on August 14, 1849, and it operated much the same way it had before. Even Dr. Wallace was still there. Uh, Me had an office, but he preferred to operate out of the store. He just liked to hang out with these guys. Um, his advertisement said he could be found there. Um, and he wasn't the only one that liked to hang out there. Uh, that's And that's really the just real historical importance of Cornell and Miller uh, as a gathering place. Uh, Lincoln and his friends would spend most of their free time there. Uh, they gathered around the stove in the winter and out in front on the sidewalk in the summer. Uh, later, Roland Miller recalled, quote, Mr. Lincoln used to drop in and sit for hours with friends and neighbors around the drugstore stove, swapping stories and discussing public questions, unquote. Uh, and this was not a small group either. A lot of times uh, it could be like 15 or 20 people. And this was not a big place. It was pretty small to get that many around that I only imagine 20 people would take up the whole store. Uh, and the attendees were, were from diverse political backgrounds, but they can, seemed to keep it civil. Uh, for their part, Cornell was a dedicated Republican, and Diller was a Democrat, but he was not really that interested in politics mm -hmm. like his cousin was, so he didn't really step on any toes. In fact, the only argument that seems to have happened that was actually significant was that uh, was caused because Judge uh, Stephen Trigg Logan liked to whittle, and sometimes he would accidentally cut up the arms of the chairs. So Miller ordered new chairs and gave the judge a stack of pine boards to whittle, and he was very offended at this, and he stormed off. And, but a few days later, he came back and told Miller that uh, he just couldn't stay away. But uh, some other participants were David Davis and Stephen Douglas, so this is like the level of people who were hanging out there. Um, Judges and lawyers would often come to and from the drugstore right after hearings. It was almost like a waiting room or a social club. Um, so really important as a meeting place. I want to quickly mention a major addition they got in 1855, which they became the first uh, drugstore in Springfield to get a soda fountain. Um, yeah, so we think of soda fountains today like, you know, Coke and Revere floats and stuff like that. But back then, it was actually med primarily medicinal. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of these medicines they made were really foul tasting. So you'd get your foul tasting medicine in one counter and then take it over and have, have it mixed into a nice tasting drink at the other. Um, and they had lots of uh, options. Mm -hmm. The formulary lists lemon, sarsaparilla, vanilla, ginger, raspberry, strawberry, and pineapple as flavors you could get. Um, and the soda water itself was medicinal. So this is a time where natural springs were sought out all over the country and the world for their restorative and medicinal properties. And some of these had effervescing qualities to their water. And so the soda water was created to replicate that. Um, so moving ahead a little bit, tragedy struck. On February 13th, 1858, the store burnt down. Um, so people, including Mr. Lincoln, pitched in to say what they could. Uh, bystander said, quote, I remember when the store was burning, meeting Mr. Lincoln with an armful of bottles. He was trying to save. He stubbed his toe on the door and dropped all the bottles. Oh, <laughs> he, he said he was no good as a bottle carrier and left the building. He returned, however, to help carry out the stove. Um, Unfortunately, the building was not insured, but the stock was, and it was insured by Edna, believe it or not, who I have my health insurance through. <laughs> so a new brick building was constructed on the same site, thankfully, and the stove was reinstalled and customers came back. And this is it, right here, this building right here. So one of the customers, of course, that came back were the Lincolns. And I'm going to talk about their account a little bit. So the ledgers and day books of Cornell and Diller still exist. They're contained at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. And the list, everything that the Lincolns bought between the years 1849 and 1860. Um, 
their purchases were pretty normal for a family at the time. Um, brandy was one thing they bought a lot, but the Lincolns didn't drink. So it was probably used for cooking, canning, and pickling. And it was also used medicinally, like a lot of other alcohols. Um, there was also something that they bought pretty frequently called essence of coffee. Uh, this was not actually coffee. Uh, it was made by boiling down molasses until it was hard. And then you would grind it up into a powder and you could make a drink out of this by mixing one part uh, coffee and eight parts essence of coffee. Uh, I imagine this would result in a really, really sweet cup of coffee. Uh, but anyway, Mary used coffee for headaches, so this is probably the reason they bought this. They also bought beauty supplies. Uh, they bought perfume and cologne by the port and uh, Castile soap, which was used to make cosmetics. Um, some of their purchases indicate the Lincoln family suffered from some digestive issues. Uh, they bought calomel, which is mercury chloride, like I mentioned earlier. Um, this is, can cause mercury poisoning, but this is like a once in a while sort of thing. So probably not an issue. They also bought bicarbonate of soda, ginger, and ipecac. Uh, they bought something called brown mixture, which was Cornone Diller's own remedy for coughs and colds. Um, it contained polarized gum arabic, polarized extract, extract of licorice wine antimony, which is like a light metal. Um, spirits of sweet niter and tincture of opium and camphor. So probably didn't do much for a cold, but probably would make your cough go away though. Uh, and then they bought some patent medicines called pain extractor, whiskers, balsam, wild cherry, and James Carmentive. And these were used for a wide range of issues. Um, the whiskers balsam was for coughs, consumption, and quote, all lung diseases. And then James Carmentive was for cramps, colics, bowel complaints, cholera, morbus, diarrhea, and dysentery. Uh, so there was also one other thing that was purchased that caused some controversy a few years ago. It's called cocoane. Uh, mm. This is not cocaine. Cocaine was developed in 1860 in Germany, um, so this was not not have been available here yet. Cocaine is actually a hair tonic, uh, and Lincoln had messy hair, so it was probably for him. <laughs> um, so interestingly enough, I mentioned earlier that blue mass was taken by Lincoln, and it is not listed in the corner of the uh, ledgers. Um, so he could have gotten it somewhere else. Um, or he could, so he took it for hypochondriasis and mel melancholia. These could have hurt his political aspirations, so there's a good chance he may have wanted to keep it under the table. Um, so he could have gotten it from Stephen S. Corneau, who was, or Charles S. Corneau, who was his neighbor, or William Wallace, who was his brother in law. And we just don't really know where he got it, but we do know he took it because he wrote about the pills making him cross. Uh, at one point. And there, it has been suggested that Lincoln was suffering from mercury poisoning. So unfortunately, Corno died on June 8th, 1860 of brain fever, which was probably meningitis or encephalitis. Uh, so ownership passed to Roland. Um, so this is Diller's drugstore. And this is the inside of Diller's drugstore in the 1870s. Um, obviously, Layton left not long after that, so the group kind of disappeared. Um, but he remains a dedicated Lincoln man. Uh, when news of the assassination arrived, Diller went to the store directly and draped it in black cape. Great. Uh, the remainder of the store's existence, he kept it exactly as it had been when there. He didn't move around furniture or anything. Um, and he actually uh, gained a little bit of fame himself. He was interviewed for by Ida Tarbell uh, and Billy Brown, and he knew Lincoln was based on the Lincoln Fever Diller. Um, and Diller became known as the uh, veteran druggist. He was one of the most uh, trusted figures in town. He was president of the Old Settler Society twice, or three times, sorry, and Sir Wilson's secretary. And he continued to Right in formulary until he retired. Uh, his son Isaac wanted to follow in his footsteps, but times were changing, so he couldn't learn on the job like he could, like Roland did. 
Uh, so he had to attend college. So he went to the Chicago College of Pharmacy and the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and graduated in 1976 and worked with his dad until they both sold out, sold out in 1901. And uh, after retirement, Roland's health kind of began failing and he passed away in uh, August 18th, 1905. And that is sort of the story of the Corner and Diller drugstore. The building, unfortunately, is no longer there. Um, it operated as a department store for a little while after they sold out. And then I believe it was torn down in the late 1920s or 1930s, early 1930s to make room for the Illinois building skyscraper, which is still there. So that's about it. That's all I have. So if there's questions, then we'll entertain those. Okay. Thank you. Anybody got any questions here or any questions online? Feel free to send those in. Um, Susan asks online, I'm not sure who she's referring to exactly, but she said, I may not have heard, but uh, did the physician talk with local natives regarding herbals? Any reference of or, or We don't know. Um, there was no mention of any of, I assume Billy really Wallace probably is who you're talking about. Uh, there's no mention of him actually corresponding with any Native people. Um, I will say a lot of Native medicine was incorporated into 19th century medicine at that time. Uh, they believed that sort of new world diseases require new world remedies, so a lot of that was taught as part of medical school. So there's a good chance he knew a lot of it already. Thank you, Mike. So what were the years of the Lincoln um, accounts? 1849 to 1860. 1849 to 1860? Yes. I, maybe I misremembered, but I thought that Lincoln took Mercury before he got married. Yeah, he actually, he took it then and he took he it, took it after, too. after too, yeah. Then you wouldn't have an account of it, right? Right. right. So, I mean, yeah, everybody took mercury. I, uh, I mean, it was that's... everywhere. Yeah. Uh, it was mostly his reason for taking the mercury. I think. Right. Was, yeah. <laughs> it would have been odd. Yeah. yeah. Um, and on the Ford uh, remedy, mm -hmm. there's a remedy for a cough above it? Oh, yeah. Or a sore throat, maybe? Is it the same? Was it part of the same? Uh, no. It just it just happened to be on the same day. Yeah, it just happened to be on the same day as well. Because I noticed that that had Kipchonis in it, which is quinine. Yeah. Is there a difference between quinine and and Chinchona uh, or not? There's not. A, well, so Chinchona is the bark of the tree right. that it comes from, and quinine is the isolated chemical. Oh. Okay. So I guess. It would be more a more purified form, probably for the quinine. All right, I've I've noticed that elsewhere, so I yeah. That was curious about that. Yeah, and actually, at our museum, we have bottles for both quinine and chinchona. So. Right. right. Um. Any other questions? I'm trying to remember what it was. <laughs> yeah. So there is. Yeah. Dark road. With borax, golden seal, myrrh, and then chemis. Yep. Oh, I know what it was. It was about cholera. So, the 1832 cholera epidemic. Mm -hmm. I was trying to remember. Actually, I was trying to look it up, but I couldn't get it. They did start to suspect. It. Because of the well in the middle of London. Yeah, that was the third color pandemic. When, so that was after yeah, the Yeah, that 18, was the 1850s. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. So they wouldn't have known that it was waterborne at that point. No, not at that point. Okay. Yeah, that's an important detail. That yes, very important. <laughs> <laughs> Moral. Uh, <laughs> More of fiber will have nothing to do with Yes. That was certainly not the only disease that was tried with, too. So. Right. Yeah. 
Right, right. Well, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's fascinating the, the uh, amount of effort that went into combating tuberculosis. I mean, in our exhibit, that's, you know, so it's kind of yeah. amazing how many sanitaria there were in the oh. area uh, because, you know, one out of four people had it, I think. Mm -hmm. so yeah, it was so widespread. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Springfield had the same Palmer tuberculosis sanatorium. Right. Yeah, they were everywhere. And the um, and it was I did, I never heard that it was transoms before. Okay. I mean, I knew about the miasma as being a. Um, but interestingly, the, the like the cold air cure for, for tuberculosis kind of follows on that idea, even though it actually had some effect. Yeah. It didn't cure it, but it, it had slowed the disease. Yeah, so they were totally off by saying bad air causes disease. Like right. you know That's they were problem. almost they were almost there. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, you can see you don't want to be around something that's rotting. Right. Because you can get sick from that, you know. So they were close. They just didn't have this really important piece of information. Right. And that's kind of how you see it. You know, a lot of 19th century medicine is them getting really close and not quite getting it. Right. The pressure doesn't hurt anything, right? No, like. yeah. It's not bad. <laughs> Any other questions? <coughs> I'm not. I'm not seeing any more online, Mike. Um, but thank you, Mike, um, for providing this presentation and um, coming all the way from Springfield to do so. Um, thanks to Janny um, for providing interpretation today. Uh, thanks to everybody attending in person. Um, or online. Um, and with that, I will end the live broadcast and, and hope everybody has a good rest of your day. Thank you again. Thank you, Pat. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Yeah.